I see guys trying to make a moral argument without a moral absolute. Yes. And I try to tell them, well, that's an arbitrary value you're trying to place because if you're materialistic, you can't claim emotions, feelings, or free will. Yeah. Therefore, as you said, we should empty the prisons. And yeah. we, we lose accountability because we have no moral lawgiver and no moral law above all men at all times. Yeah, it's, it's like Dan Barker has this harm principle, you know, do no harm to others. But he says he, he acknowledges, the, he, he says there's no God, so there's no absolute moral lawgiver, so there's no absolute moral laws. I asked Dan Barker, do you believe rape and incest are wrong for all people at all times and all places? And he said no during our debate. You can go to my website and check out my debate with Dan Barker, audio, we have the video. And so he doesn't even believe rape and incest are moral absolutes, wrong for all people at all times in all places. Yet he invokes this do no harm to, uh, to another principle. Well, what if I decide to side with Hitler and invoke uh, do harm to everybody that disagrees with my political views? Uh, if I invoke that type of principle, there's no way to arbitrate between the two unless we appeal to a higher law. And uh, so I would argue that uh, the, there is a moral law. We all have moral experience. Atheists have moral experience. They make moral judgments. And if, if, if the moral law, if the ultimate arbiter in what is right and what is wrong is the individual, then one individual cannot condemn the actions of another individual, like Adolf Hitler, as wrong. But even atheists want to condemn Adolf Hitler's actions. So then they might say, well, maybe it's just each society decides what is right and what is wrong. Well, then it'd be wrong to be a, a moral reformer of a society, a Martin Luther King, who says something's wrong with my society, I want to make it better, because society would be the final arbiter. Also, one society like America could not condemn the actions of another society like Nazi Germany as being wrong. And so, uh, so again, even atheists want to appeal to something higher. Some would go to world consensus. I don't even know if, if we can uh, figure out what the world consensus is. I'm always being told what the world thinks. But whatever the case, even atheists, who, uh, who are more, usually moral relativists, um, don't, often don't like the moral consensus of the world, the world's, world consensus. They try to change it. They try to build the, the world. A lot of atheists will say the world is better today than it was in the past, and we want to change it and reform it and make the world consensus even better in the future. So not only are they appealing to a moral law above all individuals, above all societies, and above any world consensus, but this moral standard they're appealing to doesn't, apparently doesn't change with time because they can condemn the actions of the past like slavery and condemn the actions of the present and try to work for a better future. So they're appealing to a moral law giver above all individuals, all societies, any world consensus, and it's a moral law giver that doesn't change with time, an eternal moral law giver. Now on this point, I feel in, in good company because I seem to see an emerging internal contradiction then in the atheistic worldview when it comes to morality, but I always cite Nietzsche. Now, I haven't read all of his works. I've had uh, thus, thus Spoke Zarathustra in my library for years, and I admittedly haven't finished it, but does, does he not make an argument for that, having been one of the more famous atheists in the past, uh, uh, in regard to the morality, and as you said, borrowed capital from the Christian worldview? Yeah. Um Friedrich Nietzsche is a great, great go-to guy on this. I think he was one of the most consistent atheists who ever lived. In the, he died in the year 1900, and, uh, but in the, late, uh, eight, in the uh, late 19th century, um, he basically described himself in his madman parable as a madman coming out in the early morning with a lantern. And then he realized he came out too early. The night had not yet come. And uh, he was crying out, God is dead, God is dead. And his colleagues were there, his friends were there, who also, they, they did not believe in God, but they laughed at him. And uh, what, did he die of a heart attack or whatever? And he said, well, we have killed God. We've killed God, and we don't even realize what we did because we've detached the earth from its sun. There's no longer any up or down. Um, so he basically, ate, uh, Nietzsche was disagreeing with his atheist colleagues by saying, you know, they, they believe God is dead, we've disproven God's existence, and now it's business as usual. Whereas Nietzsche said, no, we've disproven God's existence, we've killed God, and now everything changes, and that terrifies me. So it's as if Nietzsche is saying to his atheist colleagues, I agree we were right to throw God off the bridge and get rid of him, but you guys had no right to go through his pockets and pull out absolute truth and moral absolutes 
and meaning in life and, um, and some type of uh, value to human life and then throw God off the bridge. He said, you had no right to do it. That was, that's a package deal. If God is dead, truth is dead, morality is dead, meaning in life is dead, um, value to human life is gone. And, uh, and then you know, Nietzsche said, we've got to make gods out of ourselves. We've got to do something. We've got to come up with an alternative myth if need be. But at least Nietzsche understood the consequences of a world without God. Today's atheists, the new atheists, don't understand that. They, you know, um, Christopher Hitchens in his God is Great, How Religion Poisons Everything, he acts like, you know, God doesn't exist. And uh, if he did, he would be such an evil God. Look at all these evil things. So he's using God's moral law. He's using the Ten Commandments to condemn God, but he doesn't believe God gave us the Ten Commandments. And, it, and then he says religion poisons everything. So religion... Uh, is the cause of so much evil and so much horror in the world when he's just removed the whole foundation for evil. So then in effect, he's contradicting himself because if there is no God and there is no moral absolute law that is immutable and unchangeable, then nothing is wrong. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's and uh, uh, Thrasymachus, the, the great ancient Greek philosopher, I think he hit the nail on the head. He, the skeptics were going around saying, there's no such thing as right and wrong. And Thrasymachus said, well, then that means might is right. And it had a lot to do with Nietzsche and his, his supermen, the overmen, um, and their will to power. If there's no such thing as right and wrong, uh, then in the end, all that's left is man's lust for power. And those who seek the power, lust for it the most, and attain uh, a level of power will then basically force their views on everybody else. I mean, that's what, by the way, that's what political correctness is all about. It's, it's, a, it's a, one of the children of postmodernism. It's a denial of absolute truth, a denial of absolute morality. And since nothing is true, reason and intellectual dialogue go out the window. All you have are stories. And if we can gain enough power by forcing our views on others, then we can take our quote unquote truth and force it down everybody else's th throat when in reality, these postmodernists don't really believe in truth. Well, that, that brings up another quick uh, note.